and I did it. Post. Okay. No, no, no. He just he just uh, came up. Okay, people. God, you're so fabulous. You're already ready. It kind of feels like like a Le Mans race where you guys are all in your cars about to fly past me. <laughs> okay, so there's one more uh, stress way of looking at Coulomb stress that, that you will typically want to use, which is looking at aftershock files or seismicity files that have focal mechanism information. We've kind of talked about that, but I haven't gone through it with you. And just so you know where we are, if you're following along in the manual or putting notes there, that's page 47. And um, so the, the key point is that the, the Coulomb stress change on the nodal planes is only the same on the two nodal planes for friction of zero. In other words, the shear stress change on the two nodal planes is the same because they're orthogonal. But the unclamping or clamping is not the same, and so otherwise they differ. So how do you deal with this problem? How do you take advantage of this uh, wonderful data set if there's this ambiguity? And there's several ways that researchers have uh, gone about looking at that. One is just to look at shear stress. And uh, uh, Tom Parsons has a paper where he looked at the all magnitude 7 and larger earthquakes in the CM, the global CMT catalog. There's about 110 of them. And he looked at whether or not they were brought closer to failure in terms of shear stress only by the preceding earthquakes with, within 100 kilometers of them. And he found that there was a, a correlation between a shear stress increase and the occurrence of an earthquake. It's not a really strong correlation, and that might be because clamping and unclamping is not included, or it might be for other reasons. Um, another very thoughtful way to do this is one developed by Jean Hardebeck, who's here at the USGS. And she, what she did is she calculated the Coulomb stress change on both nodal planes of every shock both before the main shock and afterwards. So before the main shock's perturbing stress has occurred, you wouldn't expect any tendency for those earthquakes to be stressed. And so if you take, you can do this a number of ways, but let's say you calculate the stress change on both nodal planes. You take the nodal plane which is most positively stressed. Well, then probably something like 70% of those earthquakes in the background before the main shock occurred will have a positive value. Then she does the same thing after the main shock has occurred. And what she's going to look for is, does that move from 70% to 80% or something like that? It's that differential that she's interested in. So that's a very intelligent way to look at it. Another way is um, to do it the way uh, Nano Sieber and John Armbruster did in a paper in Nature in the 2000 where they look at seismicity alignments to try to assess which is the likely nodal plane, given the earthquakes around that one. So all of these are possible options for you, and those are the different ways you can deal with that. So what I'd like you to do, we have, let's go to input file and open uh, San Francisco Bay Area dot IMP. Oh, actually, let's, we can, let's use our MAT file. Yeah, the MIT file we created. Some of us created. <laughs> okay. Now, we're going to, right now, we have an earthquake catalog up there, but that's the readable catalog. It's not a focal mechanism catalog, so we want to get rid of it. So to get rid of it, we go to overlay. We say clear overlay data from memory, which you haven't done before, and clear earthquake data. That's a lot easier than starting over, right? OK, so now we're going to go back to overlay. We're going to go to earthquakes. And when, we, when it comes up to the, yeah. And then when it comes up to select catalog format, now we're going to choose one for focal mechanisms. And we're using the FP fit catalog, which uses Oppenheimer and Riesenberg's FP, which stands for focal plane fit catalog. So we say OK. And we go to the earthquake data folder, and you can see that there's an FP fit example. So say OK if you see that. Anybody doesn't see that, just raise their hand. You don't see that? OK, Volcan is there. Oop, yeah, so you don't see that in this file.
You can't open the earthquake data file. So maybe what you didn't do yet is you didn't clear the earthquake file that you had before. Because you have to wipe out that earthquake file. Otherwise, it's not going to let you because it says, hey, you've already got a file in there, and I can't put two at once. OK, great. So FP fit example. And it opens up a uh, filter, but we're not going to filter them. We'll just take them all. You know, but for example, what you might want to do is reduce the minimum magnitude if you think that the larger earthquakes have better, more reliable filter mechanisms. But here, we're just going to take them. OK. Did it do it? Yeah. OK. And now we're going to go functions, st stress, and we're going to go calculate stress on nodal planes, the one at the bottom. Are you there? OK. Now, only one nodal plane nodal set. Do you want to make the other set? So this. When you deal with catalogs with nodal plane information, there are a bunch of different formats that are out there. Some catalogs only give you one of the two planes <laughs> under the assumption that you recognize that the two are, are orthogonal, and this allows you to create your other. Some give you both. Often they have set one and set two, and almost always there's no rhyme or reason why they're giving you one as the number one and one as the number two. It doesn't mean that the operator thinks that number one is the actual fault plane. Or as far as we think, that's not the case. So this is yes, we have to use So do we want yes? <laughs> <laughs> so we'll say yes. OK. So now what's happened is there are earthquakes. And we have a source. Shinji, show them where the source is. It's that green line in there. And um, it's showing us which of these uh, planes are brought closer to failure, and by how much. And you can change the diameter of the circles to get more or less color, depending on um, you know, what is right for the graphic quality. So not surprisingly, as we get up to the San Francisco area, everything is basically white because we're too far away. And uh, off the two ends of the fault, the effects are uh, much larger, so it's suggesting that we have uh, larger effects there. OK, so that great question. And up in the upper corner is a dialog box, which is called the, I think, which nodal plane box. But you just see the word which. And see what it says there? It says, well, what it's plotting is nodal plane set one. You could choose nodal plane set two, or you can shuffle them. And so just randomly choose between one and another. So let's try shuffle. You're, you're expecting iPod music, but. <laughs> OK, they look kind of the same, despite the fact we've kind of randomized it. Let's try nodal plane set two and see how different that looks. Starts to look a little different. Now, if we have a higher value of friction chosen, they'll look more different when we, when we cycle between nodal plane 1 and nodal plane 2. So why don't we change the friction coefficient? <laughs> what were you doing? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just showing Oh, he's showing us the numerical file. Anyway, friction? Yeah, so functions, change parameters, coefficient of friction, and let's change that to 0.8. OK, this is a good point to make a comment about friction. All of our input files, or most of them, happen to have friction of 0.4 chosen. Um, really, there's nothing magic about that. This is kind of like, I don't know, choosing Hillary Clinton for president. Pretty much in the middle, <laughs> right? Kind of, kind, of a, kind of a moderate Democrat. So kind of will appeal to the Republicans and kind of will appeal to the left wing, too. So 0.4 represents, we know we're going to be wrong. And the extremes are 0 and 0 0.8. So if we land on 0.4, we're not going to be wrong by too much. So that's her strategy, and it's my strategy. And however, this is what our thinking is. Our thinking is that faults that have a lot of cumulative slip tend to be much lower friction, like the San Andreas, you know, 300 kilometers of cumulative slip. 
Faults that tend to be very new with just kilometers of cumulative strip tend to be very grungy and fractured and probably have much higher friction, such as most normal faults and many of the thrust, continental thrust faults. And um, so we tend to assign a high value of friction to continental uh, thrust and reverse faults. We tend to put low friction in subduction zones, which obviously have a near infinite amount of cumulative slip on them, you know, sometimes thousands of kilometers, and are very saturated with fluids and sediments going down the hatch. We don't pretend we really know the answer here, and that's why the, the slider and tools are there for you to see how much, um, what you think the right answer might be. You know, in principle, remember how if, the, if we have a simple strike-slip fault, like that, then if the friction is zero, then we have this perfectly symmetrical pattern like that, right? Now, so this is the friction of zero. Now, what about a friction equal to 0 0.8? OK, so this is Teflon, and this is the one on the right is sandpaper. Oh, wait a minute. I should have put the, uh, this is just supposed to be a uh, right lateral fall. Looks more like that. So you'd say, well, look, you should be able to tell from aftershock studies what is the appropriate friction coefficient. And we always thought we were going to be able to tell. And the best we can really say is we just have a sense that we move in this direction for faults with low slip and this direction with high slip. And maybe somebody is going to do a better job of this. There's been many, many attempts to get the answer to this. And it looks like uh, the answer is rather fuzzy. So it's a place where somebody else could really make a great contribution. The tools are there, but we haven't nailed it by any means. So OK, we were going to change the friction. Output file. Oh, there's the output file for the focal mechanism. Oh, and that's very useful. So open that again. Uh, I just um, it's in a home directory, and then move to the output files, and you see that focal mechanism sto uh, stress output. All right, and so it's it's and if somebody has the uh, Excel on the computer, so you can just it just opens in Excel. Yeah. And what we want to show you that's, um, OK, so move to the right. So um, yeah. So each row corresponds to the each earthquake. And uh, these are earthquake data. And Let's go over to element O. Keep going to the right. Yeah. OK. Strike deep rake 2 and strike yeah. deep rake 1. And shear stress should be identical. Yeah. So um, uh, apart from error in the nodal plane uh, yeah. not being perfectly orthogonal. Well, um, most of the uh, institutions just give us the uh, nodal, nodal plane integer. Yeah. So, so it's produced some, some small little round off here. But you know, these go, yeah. So you might say to yourself, well, what's the good of shuffle? You could do a bunch of realizations, and then you can decide whether or not the result looks highly dependent on knowing which nodal plane is the right one. Because my guess is that if you actually try to estimate which is the nodal, correct nodal plane, you're going to be right exactly 50% of the time. OK, so think about it now. You've seen the four different ways we calculate Coulomb stress. Stress on a specified fault, which is the Venetian blind world of faults with one strike, dip, and rake. And you can make that whatever it is. You can visualize that with the, with the strike line to see what it is. Then optimally oriented Coulomb stress, also a stress on any surface at any depth. But now we're using the regional stress. Things are redder in that world because we're always finding planes for which the Coulomb stress is optimized. And then if we plot the strike lines, which should be called the optimum planes, you know what planes we're presuming those earthquakes to be on. Then calculating stress on faults, pre-existing faults that a geologist has told us 
have a rake um, and an upper and lower depth and things that are of importance to us to calculate the stress on those faults. If we want to hatcher those faults up into smaller pieces, we can, in the input file, put a larger number underneath that first pound sign, or we can use splitter to break it up into little chiclets. And we can resolve stress on those faults or on pieces of the faults and see how um, it's affected by an earthquake. And finally, stress on focal mechanisms. And you're kind of seeing the tools that we built in to deal with this ambiguity that's a part of focal mechanism files. And you know, there's lots of uh, people out there calculating focal mechanism information that you should be able to, to grab and bring into Coulomb after a large earthquake has occurred. Um, the one we haven't talked about, it's really dead simple, is calculate stress at a point. So Shinji, why don't you go back to the, um, so now functions, you can just use the same file, stress, calculate stress on a point, the second to the bottom. Okay. <coughs> Sorry, we missed T. <laughs> ah, can we put the, oh, I see. So now what, what we need to do is toggle on and off the uh, overlay files and they'll come back on again. All right, now see that circle there at Santa Cruz, if, you're, if you know the area around here? That just happens to be a place where that calculation point, but you know, typically what you want to do is calculate the Coulomb stress at your house. <laughs> so uh, that's what I would do. And so see, get X and Y by mouse click. Now that could be... Your house. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Shinji's gonna show my yeah, very, very, very close to San Andreas. <laughs> what was I thinking? Anyway. And then hit calculate. And not only does it give you the value, it, it gives the color according to whether or not it's positive or negative, which is very cute. And you can change the uh, strike, dip, and rake for this. So one use would be that um, you have a particular aftershot. Yeah. Let's see. You can move it around a little bit. But you can see that's very, very simple. And if this <laughs> is, let's, um, Shinji, let's uh, take this back to lat lawn. No, I mean, I think close that, or maybe leave it open. But I think if you go back to the frame and you, and you change to lat lawn, then it'll give us lat lawn for the position. Uh, I see your point. Yeah, so what Shinji's going to do now is click on the frame to bring this back to lat lawn. So change coordinates. Are you guys doing that? OK. <coughs> now go functions, stress, calculate stress at a point again. And now notice that it's giving you lat lawn rather than x, y. So this is small bad. So it's more likely that you're going to want to input a lat lawn rather than an xy for the location of my house. And so that now you can do that. Obviously, you could just have information from a particular uh, focal mechanism. All right. So now what, it, yeah, Steve. Yeah. Yes. Well, Transform is no longer a Mac program. And what we tried to do with MATLAB is to move away from the need from other programs. So as you can see, all of the smoothed graphic files are produced internally. However, we don't have a 3D viewer yet that allows you to see you know, a, a surface, for example, a closed surface of the Coulomb positive and negative zone. This may be a feature that is possible to build into MATLAB. And we're happy for people to come forward with all kinds of things like this. Uh, you know, I, I say this with a full heart, <laughs> that a lot of the uh, filters that we've built are filters because people needed to filter particular files and uh, bugs that have been fixed because people identified them and, and additional add-ons that people would like to build or, or whatnot. Um, we really welcome that so this becomes more of a community-built project than, than just by us. Well, so that's a great idea to add it. Mat MATLAB can image after surfaces. Yeah. Um, is it possible for Coulomb to output that whole series of depth results to it? 
Yes. yes. I mean, it does. When you do depth range, depth range, you could just choose everything you want, and it will, it will produce all those numerical files. And then you could do it will produce the, a single numerical file with all that information, and that would need to be read by MATLAB. Yeah. So it shouldn't be a really uh, big thing. It's your assignment, and I expect <laughs> it by the end of AGU. <laughs> no, it would be great. It would be great, because we'd like to be able to see that. Okay, now we're going to move on to some volcanic sources because you volcanologists have been patiently waiting. Yes? Sorry, I don't remember where volcanism is. I just have one more question. Sure. On the bottom here, you have a big, uh, curvy looking salt. Yes. And I was just wanted to clarify it, you say that you, with the plume sources, it actually does make a little rectangle around Okay, great. I should talk about this. If, if you go down to the bottom of page uh, 48 where Jessica is, you can see our solution to the problem of working in the rectangular world. We're squares in this business. So Aloy came up to me uh, during the break and said, well, how do I deal with an, a crenulated normal fault? Because a lot of my squares will either produce opening spots or overlaps. And it's really the same thing that Jessica's talking about. And it, that means that this rectangular uh, version of things is going to produce errors because we're going to double up or have areas with no slip. And, you know, our suggestion is that you can, with a little bit of work, at least minimize the overlap and underlap by putting in secondary rectangles and removing things. But if that's, there's two options if that is insufficient for your particular problem. And one is, are these code 400 sources, just look on the bottom of page 48. Those are not squares, those are simply points, point sources of shear slip, okay? So the squares are just used to locate them in space. So they're point sources, and they're, so that means that the units of, are not slip because they have no area. The unit are, is potency, slip times area. I didn't make up potency. And um, you can see that you could create as complicated surface as you like. But there's a caveat. You can't get too close because these are point sources of shear, so they have a singularity if you get too close to them. So if they're spaced one kilometer apart, don't get any closer than a, probably two kilometers. <coughs> so then there's a trade-off. You say, well, look, if I have to place them one kilometer apart and I can't get any closer than two kilometers, maybe I can do just as well with my rectangles if I make fuss with them a little and, again, not get closer to three or four kilometers. So if, if neither of these solutions are adequate, then the best thing to do is to use the program Poly3D, which is a pro program that uses triangular T-surfaces. And T-surfaces have no singularities associated with them, and you can make as, as uh, crenulated or curved surface as you like. The, the downside of that is you spend a lot of your time gridding up that surface. And so you're less likely to want to change anything. At least for my research, if I've spent a huge amount of time to create the input files, then I'm going to pretend they're perfect, <laughs> no matter what anybody says, any reviewer, because I don't want to go through the trouble again. And so it kind of builds in a certain uh, hardening of the arteries, whereas I like to be able to change things very, very easily. Can you bring up Poly 3D just to introduce its name? No, you really, at, we should figure out a way to do that. You know. In other words, if you're using a poly 3D input file and you produce a matrix plot of stresses, we should be able to bring it into Coulomb. But we haven't created that. Another thing that we'd love to do is to build, uh, to take the output from Fred Pollitz's viscoelastic code and bring those stresses and strains and displacements into Coulomb so that we could use Coulomb to plot them along with everything, even though the viscoelastic process is being calculated in another program. So those are both on our wish list of things that take maximum advantage of Coulomb but don't weigh it down with, with things that would really uh, make it difficult to run on a small computer. So the only thing to remember on this, and we show you the fault data, is that it's the units of potency when you input these point sources rather than slip, which takes a little getting used to. Okay, so now what I want to do is look at um, dike cases. And so up until now, all of our sources are code, K-O-D-E, code 100, which is an elastic dislocation, and uh, elastic shear dislocation. And code 200 and 300 
are sources that have one component of opening as opposed to shear. So um, let's uh, take an example here of, um, I'd like you to go to the file example 8 parentheses dike.inp. And that's on the bottom of page 49. So open an existing input file. This is a vertical dike. No, yeah, example 8 dike.imp. Okay. Now, it's got a coarse grid because we're going to look at displacements first. So let's um, um, go functions, displacements, uh, and then um, 3D vectors. We didn't look at 3D vectors before, but you can imagine what they are. So in 3D vectors, it automatically gives you the 3D view rather than the 2D view. And spin this, baby, because it's fun. You can see we're looking at the vectors not at the surface now, but in, inside, and that they have vertical and horizontal components to them. OK, so now let's um, make a change here and move this to the surface. So um, functions change parameters, all right, and then we're going to change vertical exaggeration. No, it's depth, calculation depth. OK, calculation depth, that's fine. And make it 0. All right, and now we're going to do this again. Change parameters, vertical exaggeration, and change that to 25,000 make the vectors a little bigger. Because as we move to the surface, the displacements get smaller. All right, so now displacements, 3D vectors. And then swivel it again. It's kind of a mohawk. And it's actually a very interesting thing that um, is intuitive once you think about it. It's not, at first you go, well, that isn't what I'd expect for the displacement field at the surface associated with a dike. So there's our dike expanding. And what happens to the surface is it does this. It actually has a little trough in the dike. And you can see that kind of you can imagine that if you push it this way, it opens this way. And these outward displacements produce this feature here. And this is actually seen in Hawaii and in in along the dike. There's kind of a trough uh, associated with the dike zones and then kind of hills from repeated uh, pumping of magma into those dike zones. Oh, that's nice. So Shinji has um, shown this other way of looking at it. And the advantage of this uh, draped wireframe is it becomes it's a little bit more translucent, and so you can put other stuff if you had earthquakes or something else underneath it. It's a little bit more translucent to see it. Let's look at the stresses associated with this guy, too. Uh, first, let's, yeah, let's look at the stresses. So now go functions, stress, um, Coulomb stress, uh, yeah, and Let's see, what kind of faults? Let's make it strike slip faults that are kind of appropriate for the dike. So dipping, striking 45 degrees. And dip rake, what do we want? We want, uh, uh, we want either 0 or 180, huh? Uh, zero. Zero. Yeah. And we happen to have a friction of 0 there, which is just fine. And now um, let's make the grid finer, because it's too coarse for stress, really, to see something nice. So let's go down to change parameters, grid size, and make it one by one. Okay. Or two by two, two no, by two. Okay. I'll make sure, of course. 
So now Shinji's going to do the 2D map view grid to make sure that, oh, yeah, maybe that's too fine. Cool on stress change. And hit interpolating. So 45, 90, 0, and then interpolating. Take a little bit more time now because we have a lot of points that we're calculating. I got a little overextended here. Huh. Neat. And so this is where you begin to see the dog bone pattern, the lobes that go off in both directions on either side. Or you could ask yourself, um, what about uh, normal faults that are parallel to the dike? So let's try that. So specified faults again, strike zero, dip uh, 45, rake. Normal fault? Yeah, what's the rake for uh, a normal fault? Yeah. When you dip is just. And let's, and then let's give it a friction of 0.4. Well, maybe we should. 60, 55, that's fine. Yeah, I think so. Let's try this one again. That's reverse. Yeah. Well, something happened in this Something, one. yeah. I think we should reload that. Uh, All right, reload it. All right, why don't you open most recent input file? Open most recent input file. That's the same file. And then, uh, yeah. Strike should be 45. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah, yeah, that's fine, it's fine. Good. Okay, yeah, now that looks different. There's something about it before that it wasn't really reporting the new calculation. What if you just hit interpret? Yeah. And then rescale the stress because it's not very efficient at exciting normal faulting. Yeah. All right, now let's try strike slip faulting again and see if it responds. 45, 90. 180. Yeah. Yeah. There's the, the dog bone ends there. Okay, so that's the world of dikes. We also have a point source of inflation, a Mogi source. And that is code 500, and that's on page 50 in the manual. And the unit for inflation is, again, potency. You can think of it as the volume expansion or contraction of this point source where um, expansion is positive. And by the way, I should mention in the manual, you know, you see that some of the lines are red, and those are the most, what we think are the most important things. So if you're just buzzing through, look at the pictures and read the red. So for code 500, open um, example 9, parens, code500.inp. Right. Doesn't have exactly the name, same name as we say in the book, by the way. What? But Exa uh, wait a minute, look at how there's two of them. There's example 9 code 500 and example code 500. That's interesting. So let's use example 9 code 500, which is the one we say in the manual. Okay, so first what I want you to see is that um, 
Code 500 allows you to include both expansion and shear, right, right or left lateral slip. And so it's a mixed source, and that's why you see the point source plus the line. And the line refers to the orientation of the right lateral slip or right lateral shear in it. Cool. So Shinji is showing you the, uh, the Coulomb help, which you can always type things in there and see what it gives you. What's, what's that called? 500. Code 500. Tensile pressure. Oh, all right. So I'm incorrect. So, so it refers to opening, opening plus a point source of inflation. You can see that between codes 200, 300, 400, 500, you can build anything you want. You can have a dike that's got shear and normal slip and opening. Can that? Code 100. Yeah, so there, there is a list of codes, Shinji points out. So code 100 is the one that we were using all morning, which is a shear source with right lateral reverse slip or net slip and rake. Then code 200 has right lateral slip and opening. Code 300, the opposite, or a tensile slip and reverse. Code 400 was that point source of right lateral and reverse potency. Code 500 is a combination of a point source and a dike inflation deflation with the orientation of the dike shown there. And so, for example, you could um, go now to, uh, let's look at displacements, just so displacement, yeah, horizontal vectors. Let's see what we get. All right, so that's an interesting thing. We have both, let's make it a little smaller. Yeah. And now let's look at stress. So functions, cool, stress, Coulomb stress. And we'll choose, we'll just accept the uh, specified fault that it, does that look good to you? You want to change it? And let's just interpolate. So very, very interesting patterns, particularly when you include, for example, even a point source of inflation combined with a regional stress direction. You can see that even your intuition is that a source of inflation has kind of a uniaxial similar character. But given a regional stress direction, it, there will be regions around Mount St. Helens or whatever where you will expect a Coulomb stress increase in areas where we expect decreases. Yes. Well, it's actually, I was wrong. It's a point, so go to the bottom of page 50. It, it includes, on, on point number two, code 500 permits both a dike and a point source of inflation. And I think, in fact, for example, at Long Valley, you, you have both of these that are almost located on top of each other, a dike and an isolated magma chamber of some kind. So in a simple kind of way, you can produce both. But the short answer is, because we have these opportunities for two different components for every input file, we kind of just said, why not? But you can always just leave one zero, because you're right. Typically, what you're going to want to do is just look at a point source or look at a dike opening rather than combining these two. It might be uh, more complexity than is normally required. But maybe a geologist has insight that there is actually several components of displacement across the area. Yeah, the two column input style is just a legacy yeah. from the old part. And then also we just only focus on this fault strip because we are just uh, seismologists or earthquake geologists. So, um. <laughs> um, okay, so what I want to do now is show you how you can use Coulomb to digitize areas so let's say you want, you, you um, have a situation, Shinji, I want to look at this one, keep going here. So I think the case that we want to put up is something that has stress and earthquake. So I think if we go back to San Francisco Bay, 
um, dot mat that we created and open that. Okay, now we want to add to that a um, stress. So let's go stress function, stress menu, coulomb stress. And that is just fine, but let's change that saturation from 5 to 1. Okay, and actually it's, uh, let's change it to, slide it so it's not so big. So yeah, interpolating. So change that back to 5. Maybe 5 was good for what I have in mind. What do you mean, maximum of 10? But you can change it. So see how you can change it to whatever you want. I haven't tested. So here's 20. No, it's a maximum. It's oh, that's a maximum yeah. you can get to is 10? Ha, yeah. sorry. <laughs> 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 An answer is but inoperative. <laughs> we could just... Uh, uh, not that contour. <laughs> <laughs> Gag me with a spoon. <laughs> Ugly. Yeah, you can see that uh, 10 bar contour, 20 bar contour. Okay, get rid of the contours, please. Quick. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what I want to show you is this. Let's say you want to say, OK, imagine these are an aftershock plot. And you want to say, well, how many earthquakes do I have in the blue zone? How many earthquakes do I have in the red zone? And so what we want to show you, which is something on page 53 and 54, which is just to digitize a polygon. And this involves another plug-in. And so now with our stress map up, Shinji is going to go to the uh, MATLAB window, and he's going to put in a plug-in. And the plugin is called digitize underscore polygon. So just if you bring the, the MATLAB window up, which is sometimes kind of a hassle to find somewhere under there, digitize underscore polygon. I haven't tested this whole Yeah, thing. all right, we'll see. <laughs> I think it's good. All right. So now what's going to happen is, if all has gone well, you've got a cursor with crosshairs like Shinji does. And so what now Shinji is going to do is um, the mouse is a digitizing cursor, and you're going to make multiple left button clicks to cover any area. So why doesn't Shinji just cover the shadow zone and move, move around the shadow zone? No, no, I mean, you're going to just do the contours of the dark blue zone, let's say. And you can see it's making little X's as it goes. And remember that you're using the left mouse button. And then when you get to the end, you click the right mouse, right mouse button to finish it off. And if you were going to do more polygons, you would say yes, but we'll say no. Mm -hmm. And now you can see it's drawn a line connecting all those little X's. And it's identified that polygon. And now um, it's created the, this uh, digitized area in the Coulomb folder. It's called polygons1.dat that it just created. Shinji's just going to open it up so you can see what it is here. Now the idea is you bring this guy into uh, Stefan Wiemer's program, ZMAP, which is also a MATLAB-driven program, with the catalog, and it will allow you, or you can bring, maybe bring it into GMT, you can grab the earthquakes within that polygon to do statistics on them. So this is a way that you can do very quickly something that's more useful than, yeah, most of my aftershocks are in the red zones, I'm done. You know, you can actually calculate the percentage, and you can choose what area you want. So it's a tool that's in there. OK, everybody needs to stand up. You're doing really, really well. We're really near the end.
Okay, so she, she. Basically, we're at the Google Earth. What? We're to the Google Earth. Yeah, yeah. Unless there's anything else you want to do. Um, I think what we should do is this. Yeah. We should take any general questions mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. about everything that they've seen, and then you will demonstrate Google Earth yeah, last. Yeah, that's good. Does that sound good? Okay, so here's what we're going to do. <laughs> we're going to take any general questions. Frequently update the, yeah. the software again, yeah. Yeah. right? Because we found several bugs yeah. in here. You see. Right. 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 Okay, everybody down. It's duck and cover time. For which, hold on, which is my uh, mic? Uh, it's right there. Can you yeah. It's on? Yeah, it's on. They're on. Okay, here's the good news, guys. We're almost to the end. Everybody's going to make it on the 5 o'clock bus. Am I on? Okay. We're almost to the end. You're going to make it onto the 5 o'clock bus without any rushing of any kind. Two, a couple things of importance. One is that we're going to teach the Saturday after AGU, December 15th. If you meet anybody who would like to take the class, um, we, we overfilled this class, so some people got bumped, um, then you can mention to them that we're giving this class and there's room and after AGU. Also, your all-important Coulomb Maven certificates are going to be available for you at the USGS booth, where we're going to have, <laughs> a, where Volkan will be demoing um, Coulomb. So uh, I needed Volkan in the room rather than making the certificates, but you will get one. Um, and uh, that's uh, vitally important that you have one. And so what I want to do now is just take any kind of questions you have over everything you've seen today. And, you know, the feedback that we've gotten from you has already revealed a half a dozen bugs and um, three or four things that you figured out we could do that we didn't know. So it's very useful for us. And we know that if you have a question, everybody's got that question. So we'd like to hear it. And after we finish that, then we will show you how to take Coulomb files and put them into Google Earth because you don't have wireless, because the survey doesn't allow us to have wireless because of security issues. Shinji's got the internet connection and he will demonstrate it for you and uh, you can easily see how you can do it too and it's a nice thing. But before we do so, I'd like to just throw it open to any questions that you have about things that either weren't clear to you or enhancements that you'd like to see in the program. Yes, and now, now Volkan would like to give you the microphone so that uh, we're videotaping this, by the way. <laughs> and that's another thing. See that over there that says class video? The videotape for this whole class is going to be uh, downloadable. And so if you want to access it, it's there. OK, go right ahead. Um, is it possible in Coulomb to investigate kind of Lystric faults rather than just a planar structure? And Great how would question. You input that? So to, to the non-geologist, a Lystric fault is a fault that starts out near the surface steep and gets gentler and gentler. 
and it's relatively easy to make a Lister fault from a collection of planar strips. And you can do so, it takes a little bit of trigonometry, but it's easy once you put it into Coulomb to see if it works. In other words, you just plot it and look at it in 3D and see if you've got all the, the slip continuous. Now, the problem that you're going to have is you can't taper it, though, because each one of those rectangles will taper, and then you'll have places along the fault with zero slip. So if you're willing to forego tapering, and of course you could taper by hand, too, then you can make a Lystric fault. And it's a really good point, and it's our intention to be able to do things like that. I don't think we have a, an example. I'm um, making that. Oh, Shinji's <laughs> going to make it. <laughs> but yes, it is doable. Um, I think the person next to you had a question, or behind you. Mine was more of a wish list sort of beginning. Uh, the uh, possibility of importing, I'm guessing DXF is probably the most generic uh, vector format to AutoCAD or GIS shape files, and I'm almost certain MATLAB must deal with those things. So it would. It Does anybody know if MATLAB has an output for uh, ARC files and shape files? You don't think so. What about DXF? Natanya? That's the generic sort of vector. This is something that we really would love to be able to do. There's a lot of geologic information out there, I guess structures in particular. There is. Does this program have, can you put, output your files as database files? Does, what? Could we output our files as database files? No. No? Because if you can output your files as database files, then you can easily put them into ARC info. And that's basically been my workaround for, you know, how I've restructured ASCII files. It is something that we would really like to do. And the, our first attempt was to be able to import into Google Earth, which obviously has the advantage that everybody can use it. Um, Arc GIS or Arc Info is the computer mapping mainframe software out there, and so it would be really good for us to be able to communicate with it and to communicate as freely as possible to GMT, which is the mapping software that's most used by people in our own field. So it's a good, useful request. Volkan, behind you. But I thought that you mentioned that the, the cover in the, the manual was uh, done with ArcGIS, right? Yes. What, how the cover in the manual was made by uh, the very talented Sirkan Boskert, who worked with us for five years and who's now at Geomatrix Consultant, Consulting, is that's a Coulomb plot which has been draped over topography in uh, ArcGIS. And, Arc, and then he's taken it into Photoshop and fussed with the character of the topography so it has that kind of confection, sugary look to it. So yeah, he has brought in files, but those are just um, image files, not vector files, into ArcGIS. You can deal with text files, so hmm? Okay, so uh, why don't you just grab the microphone and say it? Where'd the microphone go? So Vulcan was saying that he's uh, taken files that were created in ArcGIS and brought them into Coulomb by outputting them in Arc as a text file and then reading them into Coulomb from there. And obviously one of the things we want to do is increase the number of filters are that are available to look at earthquake catalogs and variable slip models. And we'd love to increase the files of uh, earthquake faults, either both active faults, which are just surface traces, and input files, such as that California reference database. Natanya? Well, that would be a, a great thing to add. Hang on, let's give you the microphone. So 
So if you have the mapping toolbox, there is shape write and shape read. It just depends. Uh, I don't know the version. I didn't. I, I never worked really with uh, ArcGIS, but I mean, if you have a shape write, then you should be able to That's interesting. read it into any GIS. And they're part of the mapping toolbox. Originally, when, when Shinji first finished the program, it used the mapping toolbox. But the problem is the mapping toolbox costs an additional eight or $900. And we were only using it to convert between Cartesian and Latlon. So Shinji found some shareware um, code for that because we wanted to minimize the amount of stuff that people bought. Uh, but that is an argument for including it. Uh, one of our goals is on the next generation of the program to make it a standalone MATLAB application. And in that, you don't have to buy MATLAB, but everything you would need would run. And that would be much more uh, effective in the developing world. You know, Many of us are at academic or government institutions or scientific offices where MATLAB is freely available. But for others, it's a problem. And as you can see, we really need a relatively recent version of MATLAB to run for all the features to be effective. So the users kind of have to chase these developments, which is the downside. You yes. sort of answered my question. You know, Greg Allen of the GS here said there's sort of a mutant MATLAB out there that, might, like you said, might be available to other people who can't afford it or there's limited licenses in their facilities. So there you have it. Yes, and we've heard others have experimented and found that not everything runs on that shareware version. You know, the problem is that as a, as a software developer, you're kind of responsible to make sure your program works on Windows and then maybe Vista. And the Intel and PowerPC versions of the Mac have different behavior on MATLAB. And then there's Linux. So pretty soon, if you're using code that isn't really supported, you're worried about the fact that you're giving people software that may not work on their own computer. So it makes us a little bit nervous that you're not going to stay with this program if it's filled with bugs. You're going to be able to accept some low level of bugs, and then it's not going to be fun anymore. So it's our job to continue to make sure that it runs well. And with that in mind, remember, always migrate to that newer version. OK. It could be possible for future versions of Coulomb to have uh, multilayered velocity models? It's possible. A simple viscoelastic model that had an elastic layer over a uh, linear viscous half space is certainly possible. And the other solution is to mate um, Coulomb so that it accepts files that would be produced by other people's viscoelastic code, such as Fred Pollitt's or Andy Freed's, et cetera. So we would very much like to do it. Right now, we can put in inner seismic stressing uh, in a simple-minded way. But the viscoelastic component to these stresses are presumably important. And so it would be a great improvement. We'd love to do it. Well, I listened want? to that. Um, well, uh, taking the Fortran code into the uh, MATLAB is not so straightforward. Because the Fortran mm -hmm. is using loops. But MATLAB likes the matrix calculation. And then, for example, I, um, I spent a lot of time to convert the Okada's Fortran code uh, to optimize the uh, uh, MATLAB. And so we have to do the same thing for the um, uh, Fred's code or some other layered, uh, uh, half space, uh, layered model yeah. uh, to do that. It, uh, otherwise, it takes a long, long time to calculate uh, yeah, and Fred, field. Fred's code is a spherical program. It's not a half space program, which is great if you're going to look at a giant thrust earthquake for which the sphericity of the Earth's surface is a very important part of the calculation. But it creates a natural mismatch between the two. We'd have to think of some way of dealing with It's doable. But you know, the viscoelastic codes pretty much cannot be run on, on desktop PCs. They need uh, more computing power. What sort of credit would you guys like in publications resulting from Coulomb? What, oh, what a what, wonderful question. What paper question. should we be citing, and do you want a copy of, of any resulting publication? Well, of course, we'd love a copy. And on page five in the manual, we suggest uh, two papers that uh, we'd like you to cite, one having to do with uh, strike slip and one having to do with thrusts. 
And if you'd be so good as to cite them, that's all we're asking for, for your use of the program. And of course, we'd love uh, to be kept abreast of the work that everybody is doing because fundamentally the reason why we wrote Coulomb in a manner that it could be given out is because we knew that if we gave it out, we'd accelerate the pace of research. So you're going to pace us, if not pass us. And that's the idea, that we'll all move faster, that the big barrier to entering an area of research is the amount of time it would take to write your own code. And that seems ludicrous. If we can produce something that you can use, then you can go off and push the frontier in a direction, but you've gotten that head start. So that's really the idea, and the only thing we would love you to do is to cite these papers. Kind of ironically, we haven't produced the Coulomb itself as a publication. Um, it's, we could put it as a USGS open file report, but as you've seen, since we change it daily, this creates a few complications <laughs> to everyone's <laughs> lives that open files aren't really ready for. Um, we could, eventually, we, we should probably produce a quote Coulomb publication, but it's really a live dynamic beast, and so it kind of barely fits into that. But um, thank you for asking that question. I'll pay you later. Um, okay. Let's go ahead. Well, related to that, um, actually, th this is totally uh, open code, open source. Um, but uh, we hide just one file. It includes some information about the registration system. Registration system? Yeah, which, uh, uh, which is the uh, coulomb.p. P is just uh, like a binary file you cannot read. But um, most of the file is just not open. So you can, it's not a black box, you can check. But, you know, it's not a uh, uh, well-written, uh, object-oriented uh, uh, source. So that means we use many um, uh, global variables which share the uh, variable. And then you can see that um, these are uh, all capitalized uh, variables are global variable. So you can access these number on the on this uh, workspace, and you can change that. It's shared all code. So this is not well constructed, but um, it's it's good to modify the numbers on the MATLAB. It's better constructed than he's owning up to. Um, people have found actual errors in the code when we've created them, and that's an indication that people can actually go in there and, and look at it. So when you find the errors, tell us. Mike? Well, we've looked at some examples of you know, faults and how they stress other faults, but how about how magmatic sources stress one another? How would you see whether or not opening is promoted on a dike of a certain orientation? Would that just be a case of looking at the normal stress? Yes. The, the normal stress perpendicular to that dike surface would be the simplest way to look at it. So the unclamping stress. So we never actually looked at it uh, here, but you saw that rather than looking at the Coulomb stress, you could look only at the normal stress, and you would resolve that on the plane of the dike, for example, whether or not that dike is being pressurized or um, depressurized as a result of a neighboring earthquake. And you could also, of course, look at dilatation, the dilatational strain, if you think that it's a magmatic source. So that's the pressure component. Um, we haven't built as many volcanic tools as we have earthquake tools, but we welcome them. Uh, Maurizio, uh, what is his last name, Battaglia, has suggested that he has some more sophisticated volcanic sources, uh, a spheroid, for example, rather than a point source, a finite source volume that he would like to build in as codes into Coulomb, and we'd welcome that too. Another thing that we'd love to do is rather than have a uniform regional stress, to have some fractal character to the regional stress that represents the true um, heterogeneity to the regional stress. Another thing we'd like to be able to do is to rather have simple either tapered slip or uniform slip have some kind of fractal distribution of slip that is some more uh, a realization of what slip might be in an earthquake as opposed to something that's more uniform. So those are you know, some of the things on our uh, Christmas list, too. Keep, com keep, 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 keep it coming, because I've heard a lot of useful things here and good questions. Rob? Exactly.
with that lab, oh, it would seem pretty easy. Just for example, we would staff up Such a good point. Are you writing this down? <laughs> yeah, we uh, we should take advantage of the solvers that are built into MATLAB to do some inversion. And and you're right. We haven't been thinking in that area. Basically, you know, we're consumers of variable slip information rather than producers. We just are. If anybody knows a, a, a MATLAB programmer <coughs> who's interested in geophysical problems, come to us. Because we're, you know, that's really what we would like to do is to hire someone for a year or so to work on these problems with us and really uh, bring us to Coulomb 4 and, and add some of these things in. Particularly if they don't weigh down the rest of the program. You mean this is the program that Brad uh, Agard is involved in? Right. Yeah. And they have, that's a very interesting effort and, and a very, very sophisticated one. I think Brad refers to most of what we do as toy calculations. I try not to take it as an arrow in my chest, but, uh, but it, it's true we should talk to those people. I think one of the things they've really done well is the whole process of validating and testing a code, which, which we do in a in much too casual a manner, you know, by finding out if our students what the errors are. So good point. What? Yeah. Well, thank you. And you know, I, I'd also love to hear from you if you think that you might use this as a teaching tool and even a homework tool, because you can see now why we think it's it could be appropriate for that and it would be a fun way to assign a problem to students and to just demonstrate some of these things in you know one of your hour classes just do the whole thing in Coulomb and change some of the parameters on the fly. I think it would be really interesting and we'd love to hear if people give it a try. Yes? I was just going to add on to you know, the lines of the viscoelastic um, properties also just variable elastic properties, either across fault variations or with depth, could be interesting too. And uh, you know, people always say those should be used more, and they're not, because <laughs> it's not as easy. That's very, very true. Uh, somebody came up during one of the intermissions and said, well, can you have a finite width for a fault? I said, no, our faults are basically infinitesimally thin planes. However, if you take, if you have a thrust fault, rather than having one fault, let's say you have a two meters of slip on a thrust fault, you could have a stack of thrust faults each with, you know, 0.2 meters of slip over some width, and then you would uh, duplicate the effect of either a low modulus zone or a broad zone of deformation. But it's not quite the same thing as what you describe. In other words, you can, you can create a finite width, but it's not the same thing as having areas of different modulus, and they do affect the results. So the lack of true topography and the lack of different areas of stiffness are limitations. One very earlier version of the program actually had uh, two modulus zones that you could, you could choose. Yes? Yes, I have a question Paul. about how you define the geometry of the receiver faults. For example, on the cover of the, of the workbook, I can see Lander's perfectly outlined by its aftershocks. 
But what about the faults to the southwest that are sort of fuzzy? Those would be the receiver faults that are being loaded up by stresses from the lander's event. But how are you defining their, their dips at depth in okay, order to so perform the calculations? This particular calculation uses landers, the Joshua Tree earthquake, which is kind of in the lower right, um, where you don't really see the black line, and Big Bear, which is over there in the kind of center left part of the picture, as sources. Because we were looking at the seismicity that was occurring after those three events. And up to, but not including, the Hector Mine earthquake, which is the big circle up to the left. So Big Bear has been included as a source, and it's a complicated source. It's, a, it's two faults that needed a junction, according to the seismologists and geodesists. But still, there is, for this case, this is an optimally oriented Coulomb calculation. So we're assuming a regional stress direction and solving for optimally oriented strike slip faults. But in this picture, there are probably some reverse faults. And um, let's hope that the areas that are where we have a lot of earthquakes in the blue zones are actually reverse faults and not strike slip faults. So that, that is another indication of the complexity of the beast we're dealing with. And that's why it's useful to just, you have the plot up there and then just start changing the receiver faults to see what happens. Yes. Do you know whether uh, Coulomb works with the student version of MATLAB? It works? No? Okay, good. Good. That's, very imp that's a really important question. It's only $99, I think. You know, it's $2,000 if you buy it at the U for, for somebody at the USGS. This is a good moment to work at an academic institution. Uh, I have a question about the source fault. If we can about what? Uh, source fault. If, if we can change the source fault mechanism, this means uh, very long time ago, probably this, uh, this source fault is a normal fault. Probably uh, sometime this, this normal fault changes to reverse fault or another fault. We can calculate the uh, uh, Coulomb uh, stress change. Okay, so your point is, as I understand it, that often, um, Today's thrust faults were formerly normal faults, or vice versa, depending on the change in pattern. But in the Coulomb world, we're interested in how the fault is being loaded today. And so that's also a question. When you build a regional stress pattern, and you might be using focal mechanism data or uh, hydrofrac data or fault stry, the real question to ask yourself is, is this regional stress consistent with the faults that we have today and their known slip directions today? So the answer that I would give you is you always want to focus on the sense of slip that is current, regardless of how that fault evolved into that spot. So the, what, what this means is many of the faults that you will consider are not optimally oriented themselves because stress and plate tectonics keeps changing the regional stress in the fault system. So we have lots of non-optimally oriented faults. In other words, faults that shouldn't move at all unless the friction is very, very low on them. You know, the way, to, the way to think about that is if I have a, a watermelon seed sitting right here, if the watermelon seed is dry and I start pushing on it straight down, it's not going anywhere, right? Because if I, I'm almost acting just completely normal stress to it, and it's got high friction. But if, it, if I just pop that watermelon seed out of my mouth and I push down, it's probably going to go Because if you lower the friction, even if the regional, the stress pushing on it is not anywhere near optimal, it'll go. So if the faults are slippery, they can be non-optimally oriented. If they're not slippery and they're non-optimally oriented, they're never going to go anywhere. But the question to ask yourself is, what is the rake and slip direction today? That's, that's where I think Coulomb is most appropriate. If we can change the rule. I'm not sure I understand that question. Uh, that means uh, the earthquake trigger uh, uh, probably uh, another, another source fault probably trigger another receiver fault. And, and also this, this receiver fault probably as a uh, uh, source fault. Let's talk about that afterwards. 
Okay, I think with the time remaining, what I'd like to do now is uh, demonstrate. Ross, one more question. Okay, Google Earth. So let's, yeah, get ready for that. Uh, can we use uh, Coulomb for uh, dam deformation studies? What? Can we use Coulomb for dam deformation studies? That's a because good. Because we don't have any fault parameters here. Um, I think we could fake it. I think we could put kind of a horizontal yeah. dike near the surface and put expansion on it to produce a vertical force uh, associated with a dike filling. Okay. Uh, but it's not ideal. We don't have a surface load in Coulomb. <coughs> and of course, we're not capturing the fluid effects of that dam. That uh, you know, Coulomb is a dry. Pro despite the fact I told you we do our best work in bars, Coulomb is a dry program, and so with the with the <laughs> if side effect that we can vary the friction coefficient, we're really not including fluid effects. So there's another you know fruitful series of things we would love to add to the program that include do fluid diffusions. The short answer is it has a rather limited uh, use for that, and we could build those tools in. Okay. Let's, as closing ceremonies here, let um, Shinji demonstrate the that, use of Google well, Earth. Ross, just, just one, one thing to remind, that, which I reminded you earlier, that because of our subduction zones, the faults are dipping. Yes. So just make, make sure you mention that oh, yeah. to do cross-section in, di in dipping angle. Okay. So remember in the slides that I showed you, the, the 1960 Chile earthquake and the 1995 Chile earthquake, and I told you those are not stresses at a horizontal surface. Those are stresses on the fault itself, on the source fault. And so in, when you make cross-sections, stress cross-sections in Coulomb, you will see on the um, uh, control panel that, that you can choose a dip. The dip does not need to be 90 degrees. So you can make your receiver fault, or the fault on which you're calculating the stresses, identical to that source fault. And that's how we looked at the distribution of stresses around the Chilean earthquake. It was a very simple way to look at stresses on the subduction zone, for example. It's a dipping stress cross-section. You'll see that in the manual. Are you ready? Yeah, before that, um, I want to just briefly mention about the uh, variables in the workspace. Okay. Um, so these are all capitalized uh, variables. So you can, well, uh, in the class, uh, we change the, uh, for example, calculation depth using some command. Uh, using some menus, but you, you can also change the uh, calculation depth from uh, changing the numbers in the uh, workspace. Uh, for example, uh, we have uh, uh, we have friction. Now it's 0.4, but you can directly change the quick equal uh, 0, 0.0 something like that. Um, and also, you can see that um, let's click data, and it said real number. So, and the, uh, we don't have much time. But yeah, starting to get yeah. So here's the element corresponding to the uh, old column in the input file. So you can directly change the number here rather than uh, using uh, text editor if you are familiar with the MATLAB uh, <laughs> calculation. So that's great. Okay, so now we're on bottom of page 51, and, and Shinji will just walk you through a case of using Google Earth. And so you want to do the landers? Or do you want to yeah, do the Bay Area since yeah, you've got landers. it open? You, whatever well, you want. Yeah, the landers. OK, try the Bay Area first. Um, OK, let's go to the uh, vector. Yeah. Or you, first, you have to change to uh, latitude and longitude. No, I think it's okay. No, you, you can't do. Can you can do X, Y? Yeah, I guess so. We've told people you have to use latitude and longitude. Okay. Okay, so you're now going to put right. the vectors on it. And you can so what he's done is he's just taken that file. He's made sure that it's in latitude and longitude. 
although we have a little difference between us whether or not that's necessary. And now he goes to the command line and he writes Coulomb to Google Earth, where the two is a number two. You can't, you can create the file, but you, yeah, yeah, you can do it. You can do it. That's a good point. You just can't look at the file. And um, it tells you that it's created this file. And then you can just drag that KML file onto Google Earth. You want to do it? Okay. Oh, see how it says it's done. Um, where's the file? <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, he's got it. So now, do you drag them all? Yeah. So now, look what he's going to do. He's going to just grab all the all these. Um, you want to see earthquake also? Um, sure. Let's not do the area box, though, because that's no fun, right? Okay. Yeah. So now he's going to take those and drag them onto Google Earth. Wait, we don't have time. Look at the clock. Okay. I, if you want them to take an hour later, I can repeat it. Do a perspective, yeah. And see how easy that was? I'm sorry that you, we can't have wireless in here. We wanted you, my original plan was at the end of the day, you would all do this, and then you would all take a screenshot, and then you would all email it to your mother. Because <laughs> <laughs> after all, if mom doesn't see it, she doesn't believe we did anything of any use. But I think this could be really good. My mom would like this. So um, now also in Google Earth, you can exaggerate the topography of up to a factor of three, but I forget how to do it. Does anybody well, know? Yeah, this is top of off and on. Oh, OK. There's the exaggeration. All right, now we want to do one more thing, which is to bring a, we have time for that? To bring the color in. If you look at page, let's just look at page uh, 53. You can bring the color gradient plot in as well. And Google Earth allows you to adjust its translucency, which is very, very useful. And how you do this, it's explained in the manual. You create the file, and then you open it in a drawing program, and you get rid of everything but that raster color gradient image. And then you save it as a uh, JPEG with a particular name. You give it the name. We, we explain it to here on page 52. You call it coulombmap.jpg. And then you again type coulomb to Google Earth. And Google Earth converts that JPEG. And you drag that on. And then you'll be able to create the kind of picture that you see here. So again, it's really easy to do. But there's one intermediate step. You want to strip off everything but that color gradient um, uh, bitmapped image. Yes. Magic. <laughs> it, it, it actually retains the coordinates internally. And so it delivers them to, uh, in KML language, you know, uh, keyhole markup language, in a manner that it can read. So that's a really nice thing that even though it's just a JPEG, it actually has saved that. So I want to leave you, let's put the lights up. I want to leave you with the idea that I think you've seen enough, you've done, you know, 85% of the things Coulomb can do. And I think because you've had your head in the manual, you kind of know where to go for the others. And my advice to you is to keep using the program a little so you kind of keep that muscle memory growing and not shrinking. My experience is that uh, that's, how it really, that's how it really takes off. And I want to say what a pleasure it is to have shared the day with you. And I hope you feel like we all dance together here. And that uh, you've really come a long way from that two-step to uh, the tango that we ended up with. And I also want to emphasize again how important for the Coulomb team, Volkan Sevelgen and Jin Lin's help in everything that we do. And of course, Shinji's mind, my mouth, 
really, uh, the, we all owe a great debt to Shinji for creating the program in the first place. And, you know, we welcome your comments. We try to take the technical support questions and answer them as quickly as we can. And we're open to suggestions and additions. So um, I really thank you for, for spending the day with us right before this giant meeting and hope that uh, you feel like you can now do some new things and cover some new territory that you couldn't before. So thank you.